recording all right well we have already we have already uh, established that it's very strange very strange summer in uh, certain parts of the world <laughs> or very strange winter in certain parts of the world with temperatures of course that do not correspond to either summer or winter depending where you whether you live in Australia or somewhere else but um, so much about the uh, global trends like you know global warming global uh, global cooling or whatever it is anyway it's a crazy world in which we live anyhow well today i just want to cover something that uh, i believe most of most of uh, church of god members would know it is will you go to heaven and of course most of you will probably say no <laughs> it will and most of you would tell me that's not the reward of the saved yes that's right but you know heaven when you say heaven remember there's that song there's this guy this guy i can't remember what was his name heaven oh, i mean heaven anyway heaven you know that one short word summarizes the blessed goal of all christians all christians around the world because it gives the very meaning of the purpose of life and the essence of the hope of life after death <laughs> or does it now millions of professing christians think so you know but the question is are they correct if heaven what they think it is namely the prayed for and worked toward the reward of the saved is heaven really that all that you see today uh today i'm i was reminded that last week this past week uh, somebody from nigeria wrote to me a sabbath keeper who keeps faithfully he says the sabbath with his family and uh uh, is not joined to anyone so he wants to kind of join this work if he is sincere of course uh, he said you know could you send me some materials which i did uh, some could not be open but uh, the, the 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 file containing teaching on heaven was able to be opened and uh, he was very humble at least and he was on it he said to me oh i didn't know that i would not go to heaven i didn't know that the kingdom of god was in the earth and he said it seems there's so many other biblical uh, teachings that i did not understand well yes indeed brethren that's one thing that i've noticed and that i've been trying to address and this is that uh, you know there are many sabbath keepers around the world and i certainly want i certainly being a sabbath keeper myself uh, and uh, being a man who loves the house of israel and all of that i certainly want to get connected with all of them and at least you know we can have a cordial relationship we don't have to belong to the same to the same organization or we don't have to even perhaps even perhaps we don't even believe all the things the same you know church of god you know uh, uh hope of israel united uh, hope of israel worldwide church of god is really very unique kind of uh, a group of people that has a long history and i certainly realize that some of the teachings and things that we have understood from the bible go way 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 back and certainly makes us very distinguished among the uh, among the sabbatarian uh, community but i also realized that the wider sabbatarian community certainly lacks a certain very deep understanding of the bible and has adopted many protestant many protestant ideas because those protestant ideas seem to be biblical logical and based on the bible or we can just say or oh, are they no they are not of course and one of those one of those uh, errors that many sabbath keepers around the world who are not perhaps who are not part of the church of god community or not part of the hope of israel worldwide church of god simply adopted this going to heaven as a as a reward of the saved as paradise and they've adopted it you know uh, basically being under the influence of the protestants so the fact is that if we are true christians brethren we need to know the truth and even if we already know the truth which i think is the case with many of you or most of you we still need to be able to prove it so no doctrinal question strikes closer to the heart of traditional christian belief than the truth of the biblical teaching on the doctrine of heaven quite surprisingly of course the biblical teaching about heaven can be easily summarized in a brief sentence or two in short heaven is the celestial place of god's throne his headquarters of government of all things seen and unseen it is decidedly not the promised reward of the saved 
certainly not the promised reward of saved Christians. And uh, it's all, of course, you know, uh, what we know about heaven I just mentioned, you know, a celestial place of God's throne, God's headquarters of govern government, you know, uh, it's also different from the usual teachings of this world. Usual teachings of this world, of course, are completely, completely opposite to all of that. No doubt that my last, the last thing that I said, the last thing that I said that, uh, you know, that uh, heaven is not the promised reward of the saved would shock most professing Christians because most have been taught and have blindly accepted without any proof that heaven is indeed the goal and hope of life itself. Now most persons, even though not having seen heaven, carry with themselves this mental image of it. You know, usually this image you can see them sometimes painted on their social networks. It's a sort of spiritual paradise, replete with adorning clouds populated by angels, and those angels are having wings, hollows, and long flowing golden hair. And of course all that, brethren, is just totally, totally opposite from what the Bible says. You know, the angels, of course, certainly are not like, you know, they just are huge, huge beings. We cannot even imagine them. They're not like human-like, you know. They can manifest themselves as humans, but they're not. They're not like human-like beings with long flowing golden hair and all that stuff. And also to be found there in that very picture are usually the souls. Now take souls under quotation mark. The souls of the faithful cluster together in holy groups, playing on harps or beholding the face of the Lord in trance-like fixation millennia after millennia. Could you just imagine yourself being, you know, uh, being in a trance-like, in a trance-like image, in a trance-like uh, situation, fixing, you know, uh, fixation millennia after millennia, <laughs> and watching, looking at God's face and harping, I don't know, uh, harps, you know, playing harps or whatever. Well, how boring that is. It's amazing how boring that is, and let me just say something else that I've just uh, that, that, that I just ran across this last week. Uh, a comment it was on Facebook, and a very 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 poignant and very true comment that you know Satan has no future. Satan knows that his time is over, and with with the return of Jesus Christ, Satan will be deposed from the face of the earth, from the throne of God, from the throne from the throne of, of, of rulership over the earth. And Jesus Christ, who qualified, remember Matthew four, when he was tempted by Satan, Jesus Christ qualified to rule over the earth. Currently, the earth is ruled over by the God of this world, and it is Satan. It's not God the Father. Anyway, so. Jesus Christ is qualified, has qualified by his life, just like we are qualifying now by resisting the Satan and uh, trying to live Christ-like life and striving to be perfect, just like we are being qualified for the kingdom of God. That is how Jesus Christ, our, 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 our Savior, and the one who was the first, the first among many others who will follow, who is the first one, the firstborn among, uh, from the dead, uh, Jesus Christ before us, qualified to rule over the earth. Anyway, so, it's very interesting that, uh, it's very interesting that uh, when he comes, of course, he's deposed, he'll depose the Satan, but many people have no clue about that, because they don't understand that Jesus Christ was tempted, even though in Matthew chapter 4 it says very clearly the temptation of Jesus Christ. And even though the, for that temptation he, remember, fasted for 40 days, and even that he was ready, and he resisted all the temptations of the of the Satan who told him, look, look at all this world, look at all these kingdoms of this world, you know, just bow to me and I'll give, you, give it to you. You see, what does that tell you? That only tells us that who is ruling this world, brethren, is so clear. Just use your common sense once again. If Satan is entitled to give to Christ or anybody else all those kingdoms on the earth, then who is the owner, who is the ruler of this world, brethren? Just use your common sense. Many times, billion times, you hear me always saying to you, use your common sense, brethren. Use what you know from the Bible to give yourself answers to some uh, mysteries or dilemmas or whatever. In any case, in any case, uh, Jesus Christ is coming. He has already qualified by resisting the temptations of Satan. So he qualified now to rule and to take position of rulership over the earth. But that will not happen until he comes back. When he comes back, that will only happen then. In the meantime, 
we are resisting the Satan being also qualified all of us being qualified and you know being in the process of qualification to rule together with Jesus Christ when he comes back so you know that's a clear picture that we have from the Bible that's a clear picture we should have about the Bible and we should know about the plan of God for salvation of all humankind because the uh, gates, so so to speak, sp uh, figuratively speaking, gates of understanding uh, and opening minds will be given to all the humans who will survive until Jesus Christ and who will survive until his coming and then will enter under the government of God, which is under the kingdom of God, and they will become the subjects of the kingdom of God. At that time only will when Satan is finally deposed from his earthly throne, and that time God is going to open the minds of all humankind who lived up to that point, and then all humankind is going to understand the plan of God and all of his truth. Because it says in Isaiah chapter, chapter 11, the prophecy says that the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the water, as the sea is full of water. So that, that, that was the analogy. So, and that's something that we should know. That's something that shouldn't be a mystery to us, brethren. But sometimes it seems that many of the Sabbath keepers around the world uh, do think that they've been called at this time not to qualify for the kingdom of God, but they've been called now to evangelize and try to convince others that they should keep the Sabbath and, 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 and be righteous and so on. No, no, not so. Not so. Each one of us has been called, yes, we know, to spread the gospel message for a witness, not the... Not for conversion, but for a witness. That's number one. And number two, we understand that we're in the process of being qualified for the eternal life and for the kingdom of God that is to come. And we need to have very clear, we need to have very clear pictures about that, brethren, because, uh, uh, because we are constantly being bombarded with all of these wrong pictures on the social networks about heaven, uh, wrong pictures, wrong ideas that we are, that the reward of the saved is to go to heaven and so on and so on and so forth. And we need to resist that because that's all anti-biblical, brethren. That's all being dishing out that's something that's being dished to us with the influence of satan the devil of course who just wants us he just wants us to be uh, to to understand the kingdom of god to be something dull because you see he has no future he's going to be deposed at the return of jesus christ and he's going to be thrown into the bottomless pit he has no future he has no presence you know, his presence is that, that he knows that his time is short and that he has a short time, and that's it. He has no future. He has no nothing to, to hope for. And then what he does, one of the things that he does, brethren, is that to, 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 to pose these things and images on, 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 on the social network, and at the same time, because he has no future in the kingdom of God, he's trying to portray to humans... And, to, of course, especially to us who have been called at this time, who passed figuratively from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of kingdom of, of, of God, he's trying to portray the kingdom of God as being something being boring, something being dull, something being not interested, you know. And then people, of course, living in, this, in his world, because he's the ruler of this world, people being, they think, oh, oh, the kingdom of God, really, how uninteresting. You know, it's going to be boring, it's going to be, it's going to be stale, it's going to be non-interesting, and, you know, and people have sometimes, uh, uh, inadvertently, people adopt this vision of the kingdom, of kingdom, something distant, something to be boring. Why should I bother about that kingdom? Why should I be, the, why should I be uh, uh, qualified for the kingdom? It's something boring. Well, brethren, that all comes from Satan. Kingdom of God is very exciting and very, 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 very interesting. And we cannot even imagine. And God has got these huge projects for us here on the earth. Not somewhere in heaven that we should be, you know, fixated or, you know, on, uh, looking at God and, and praising God. There's some process of praising God day and night. Brethren, please. God wants to be praised through action, through action and work. God is not praised through inaction and, 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 and lack of, lack of any, any efforts on the part of those who are supposed to, you know, uh, to, to, to praise Him and to serve Him. God loves action, even like today. God doesn't call into the, his church the non-workers and lazy people. God is now, God is now carrying out his work. 
And what is his work? Well, his work, of course, as you know, is he called us to spread for, for a witness to spread the gospel message. And those who refuse to do that work now, because to them the kingdom of God is something boring and something, something, something distant and something, you know, whatever that that Satan keeps keeps constantly keeps uh, fooling them and deceiving them. Those people have to do work in the great tribulation. That is the work of the Phil of the not Philadelphian but the Laodicean church. I think I told you that many times. Whoever doesn't want to do work, the work of God now, will have to do it before Christ comes, because He doesn't. He doesn't call to His church non-workers and lazy people. But I don't want you, brethren. In the meantime, I don't want you, and I'm going to hopefully, hopefully this year and and, and beyond. You know, I'm going to fight this notion that the kingdom of God is something boring. You know. Because that's what Satan wants you to believe, brethren. That it's not worthy all the effort. That it doesn't... <laughs> no vale la pena, as the people would say in the Spanish-speaking world. That it, you know, it's, 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 it doesn't pay off. That it's something, something, something just, you know, something just, just boring and uninteresting. And why should we bother about something that is so far away from us? Who told you the kingdom of God is far away from us? And who told you the kingdom of God is so boring? Brethren, we have to restore the whole world. world. We have to restore all the extinct species of animals, number one. Number two, we have to clean up all the all the world from all those gases and nuclear nuclear and, and, and the consequences of the nuclear war and, 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 and the chemical war and the consequences of human sin. We have to clear all, all, all it up and prepare the earth for the second for the second resurrection when billions upon billions of people who never had the chance for salvation will come up. Is that boring? I wouldn't think so. To me, it's more boring to be, you know, fixate, have fixated eyes on, 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 on God the Father, as the Protestants usually portray it, and, you know, to clap your hands or harp, you know, so, you know harp the, uh, play the harps and, 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 and praising God day and night without doing anything. That's not God, friends. That's not God of Israel, brethren. God of Israel gave us command through Jesus Christ to look for the to look for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, for example. Is that boring? Do you think that looking how are we going to be looking for the lost sheep of the house of Israel? By by what? By sitting and, and, and praising God, you know, praising God all day and night and not doing anything. No, 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 that's not God. So please Please get out of your mind every time you, you, you have this thought that the kingdom of God is something boring, you know, you know get, that out, get that satanic thought out of your mind, brethren. Because we are in a spiritual war. And it, we are incessantly being attacked by this evil force called Satan with all his, with all his satanic ideas. One of which is that the kingdom of God is something boring and we don't really want to be in the why should we be in the kingdom of God, you know? That's his ideas. God has got very marvelous, wonderful plans for us to repair, to do good things on this earth, and to make it finally a place for billions upon billions of humans to come back to life. Why do you think there will be no no more seas? There are no more seas. Anybody think about it? Why do we have to get rid of the seas? Well, first of all, because it will be more territory. Secondly of all, the bottom of the sea is fertile. It's, 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 it's full of natural resources. You know. To give you just one example, sometimes in the 80s, in their part of the sea, the Dutch discovered a very rich source of oil. And that, of course, has given them has has has, has given them certain uh, economic advantage because they were just able now to supply the oil to other nations. And since they're a small nation, they could just keep part of it for themselves for their own needs, and the rest they could export. And that has given them uh, incredible and tremendous tremendous advantage, brethren. For just just to give you that one example, so. Just please do not let Satan deceive you with his wrong thoughts. Just like I keep 
telling you not do not let Satan deceive you with wrong religion and wrong religious practices. All of these religious practices are sun worshiping, brethren. All this so-called Christianity around us is sun worshiping. They keep sun day. They keep pagan days in order to sun. And it all goes, it all comes from where? Well, it comes from original, original Babylon. The one created by Nimrod and his wife, his, well, his, his, his mother, wife, Semiram, his brethren. All of this perversion, including this, the very February, well, uh, today is the 10th. So in about four days, we'll have so-called we shall we shall have so called day of oh day of, of of love you know people who are in love you know valentine's day the valentine's day if you didn't know that please get informed if you don't know it please ask us who know valentine's day is a celebration in honor to semiramis and nimrod and so many people don't know it and then in four days will be in three four days we'll have we're having people exchanging gifts and expressing their love and cupids, little cupids with, 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 with pierced hearts and all of that rubbish, brethren. Just like we are to avoid the wrong religion, we are also to avoid the wrong ideas that Satan has been shooting at us. And I cannot, exp I cannot, uh, uh, underline that big enough how important that is because from those ideas then you you know you, what comes to your life if you think that the kingdom of god is is something boring then how excited are you going to be about the return of jesus christ how excited are you going to be be about the king about that kingdom about that world to come as the apostle paul calls in hebrews so resist the satan what i just mentioned to you these souls of faithful cluster together in holy groups and all these other things brethren this is probably the most people's belief about heaven what it is for and what what it is like but it is not the picture the bible gives what is the biblical teaching well it is best to first show what heaven is and then what it is not many are surprised to find that the bible including our friends in nigeria now they, they have found it out many are surprised to find that the bible speaks of not just one but three heavens. Yes, three heavens indeed. The first heaven is our earthly atmosphere, the blanket of life-sustaining gases that encircle our globe. The heaven where the birds fly, as it is mentioned in Genesis 1 verse 20, and from where the dew falls. Deuteronomy 33, 28, it's part of the, you know, it's part of the blessings to the house of Israel. It says God is going to give you dew in its certain time. So let's read it. Deuteronomy 33 and verse, verse 28. Uh, sorry about these shootings. I don't know what is going on outside. And I don't know, you know, it's a pagan world and I don't know what it is today. It's just a February, but somebody is either hunting something, killing somebody or, or, or I don't know, doing what. It's a pagan, it's a present evil world, evil world in which we live. So for, sorry. And I've been, by the way, I've been, one of the reasons why I've been, I've been uh, hoping and praying to move out of this city is because of its pollution and because of all of these noises that i don't want you to be hearing because i want to have peace on the sabbath and if possible in all the other all the other days in any case deuteronomy 33 verse 28 says then israel shall dwell in safety the mountain of jacob alone in a land of grain and new wine his heaven shall also drop dew drop dew you see so uh, this is where from from heaven from which the dew drops that's also the first the very first heaven that the bible reveals to us then above the atmosphere above the first heaven is the second heaven the second heaven represents the expanse of this great universe you know when we look at the sky when we look at the moon on the sky, uh, you know, when we look at the outer space, when we look at all this, all this sky dotted with various, various stars, you know, the outer space where we find the sun, moon, stars, comets, and planets, that's the second heaven. It is of this heaven that God spoke, where he said that the sun, moon, and stars were to be given to us as lights. So that's in Genesis chapter 1. And verses 15 to 17. Let's read it. Verses 15. And let them be 
for lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light to the earth and it was so then god made uh god made uh, two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also so here it is here is the second heaven and then the final the third heaven uh, believe it or not, is mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 because the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians is actually speaking of a man, he knows of a man who went to the third heaven. Now a man, of course, he doesn't speak about anybody else, but he speaks about himself. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 2, he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows such a one was caught up to the third heaven heaven brethren the third heaven is indeed the location of god's holy throne and the seat of the ruling authority of all physical and spiritual reality and it certainly does have some of the qualities traditional christianity assigns it to yes because you know uh, all the churches all these christian churches yeah, and even those who are not christian they all they, that's 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 another tactic of satan they they all s contain at least some aspect of truth you know all of them yes indeed all of them you know at least all the christian churches teach that jesus christ is a savior is that the truth yes it is the truth you know a little bit of truth but then there is just all this mixed up along with the truth you have all this mix up all the errors and it's a chaos just like with the sabbath keepers you know the sabbath keepers uh, uh, found the sabbath so uh, you know you know they got the truth and then what else happened well then then they thought that all the all these other sabbath keepers namely adventists or even church of god seventh day they must be that their, their various doctrines must be true so along with the sabbath they imbibe all these non-biblical non-biblical contrary to god truths and they think that that's that's the truth uh, let me just give you one illustration that has been coming to my mind constantly this week and the illustration is about Enoch and Elijah. Enoch and Elijah, who supposedly went to third heaven. Now, brethren, how 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 anti-biblical, how heretical, how blasphemous it is. Because if we believe that Jesus Christ is our Savior and Lord, and it says, if it says in the Bible, He, only He is the firstborn from the dead, then how could Enoch and Elijah, who lived before Jesus Christ, how could they have attained uh, eternal life and how could they have gone to the third heaven and how could they have got you know how they have how they how could they have become immortal before jesus christ how but that's a doctrine that you know people have adopted sabbath keepers worldwide believe that because they've adopted it from protestantism because the protestants have completely misunderstood what he says about enoch and what it well and what it says about elijah which means if those people lived before christ and gained its immortality that means that either enoch or elijah are your savior and not jesus christ really just think about it how ludicrous that is and yet millions of people believe that and millions of protestants will i think even give their life for that for that lie believing it to be the truth which is not so that's why I'm saying that's why it is why it is crucially important, brethren, that we uh, guard ourselves not only from from wrong religion and religious practices, but also not only from Babylonian doctrines, but also from these these strange, stupid, non-biblical ideas that because of misunderstanding of the hebrew they look to be they look so right they look so biblical but they're just contrary to the bible brethren completely that is why i just keep cautioning you resist yourself from those wrong ideas because the wrong those wrong ideas will then lead you to other wrong ideas to other wrong ideas to other wrong ideas and in the end until at the end of the story, you are just completely lost, and you have lost the awareness of the true biblical doctrines. And perhaps now you understand, some of you, why I have been saying that keeping the Sabbath is not enough. Keeping the Sabbath, having all these myriads of unbiblical doctrines and stuff, it just, just, just doesn't make sense. 
Because if we are deceived to leave those doctrines, you know, different stupid doctrines that have nothing to do with the Bible and with Christ, if we are deceived to leave them and yet keep the Sabbath, what's the ver what is the what is the worth of that Sabbath keeping? If we sit on the Sabbath and listen to the, uh, you know, crazy doctrines like Enoch and Elijah, which would just lead us, which are just blasphemous, then what is the purpose of the Sabbath? Yes, the purpose of the Sabbath it is to be rested, you know, to, to get rest and, and, and be rested uh, and be, you know, be at peace and use that time for uh, you know for more prayer more bible study for you know for enjoying this this pretest of the kingdom of god because each sabbath is a pretest of the kingdom of god yes i do agree with all of that but i'm asking you what is the worth if you're going to be learning and believing blasphemous doctrines at the same time and yet there are thousands of i i almost said millions but possibly millions of sabbath keepers around the world who just, along with keeping the Sabbath, are just imbibing every Sabbath totally wrong doctrines that have nothing to do with the Bible. And it's tragedy. It's catastrophe. You know, this past week also one very young person from, from this country, which is very unusual, contacted me and said he is loosely listening to my teachings on the YouTube channel. He heard something he wanted to, to, to check about the source of such information very very polite young man he lives on a he lives in the countryside even even, even more beautiful and he is into the uh, honey production which is even more beautiful i noticed he was even married and so on but he keeps a sabbath yes i i kind of sense from his the way how from what he uh, from what he was interested in that he keeps a sabbath indeed he keeps the sabbath but then, you know, uh, and then uh, that same night or tomorrow night, he just said, uh, oh, by the way, about the holidays, he says, uh, you know, if you thought that I keep the, I don't keep the holidays because I didn't understand uh, that other than the Sabbath, that any other, any other days are to be kept. Very, very honest from him. I said, yes, they're to be kept. And I gave him the reasons why. And I, you know, sent him some written material from, from that I've, I've been having for I've had for 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 decades and uh, I don't know what he's going to do with that information and but anyway at least I'm very happy when people are at least humble enough to ask for more information or when they're honest enough to know to 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 to, to say that they didn't understand something they didn't believe something and you know that there is something new that they've heard, that there is something new they have to think over, and so on. But then we have to be people like that. We have to be, first of all, uh, people who are providing encouragement and uh, uh, encouraging people to think for themselves and to think over what they know. And if they don't understand something from the Bible, then to show them where does it say about the holidays you have after Jesus Christ. Well, here's one simple reason. After the death of Jesus Christ, when everything that needs to be uh, done away is done away, you do have in the book of Acts, you have the, the apostles and the early church keeping the holidays. In fact, the Holy Spirit came on the first, on the day of Pentecost. It came in the New Testament. So, you know, that's one strong argument. And that's enough for those who want to, you know, who those who want to understand the Bible humbly and, and, and who are humble before God, that's enough. Another reason is, if you didn't think, if you go to Leviticus 23 again, and God says, these are my holidays. The first one is the Sabbath, the uh, weekly holiday, and then comes all these annual holidays that happen once a year. So we need to be able to encourage people in, in, in those simple things. To encourage people that based on the revelation God has given us, we keep that and that. And don't, you know, don't, 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 don't use that. The church, the church keeps it. This, forget about the church. The church has nothing to do with your personal convictions. And after all, the Apostle Peter says that we should be always ready to give the answer uh, of the hope that is within us to all those who ask. So please give them the answer. 
Or if you don't know the answer, be humble enough to seek it from others who know the answer. We are to be able to be people able to do that. And, and again, you know, whether those people will accept the answer, what they will do with that truth, that doesn't matter. It's not our business. It's the business of God to open their minds if he wants to, if he is calling them, them uh, at this time. So anyway, here in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2, is perhaps a revelation to some of you. God, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul speaks of the third heaven to where to which he went. You know, so the third heaven is a type of a spiritual paradise that we can we can deduce them from reading his account. The Apostle Paul called as much said as much in 2 Corinthians 12 and in verse 4 when he briefly described the place and called it paradise. And further, it is plainly the seat of God's throne and of his power, for we are taught by Jesus Christ not to swear to heaven because it is God's throne. Matthew 5, have you ever noticed Matthew 5? And yet many Christians, as if they have never read Matthew 5, keep Keep, you know, swearing all left and right about various things. Brethren, Matthew ch chapter 5 <coughs> tells us not to swear by anything, even by heaven. Matthew 5, verse 34. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, not by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your yes be yes, and let your no be no, for whatever is more than this is from the evil one. Have you realized that? Even more than yes and yes and no, no, is from the evil one, brethren. Let's take it seriously. Let's take it seriously, you know. But so many people who even claim to be Christians who confess Christianity as their belief, they just swear, left and right. In the courts, before these various bodies and stuff, what's what's the point? Then what's the point of, 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 of what Jesus Christ told us? Oh, we have to swear because, well, we don't have to. We have to follow Jesus Christ and his example. We have to follow God even if it will cost our, us our lives, even whatever what the worldly authorities may think about it, we don't care, brethren. We have to follow God even if it costs our lives. And I don't know how many people are willing to sacrifice their lives for their beliefs. You know, in the Middle Ages, I, I know that thousands of people were, were willing to be tormented and tortured in un, 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 uh, unimaginable ways by the by the Inquisition and, 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 and end, up, end up their lives on the... In fire, Polycarp, Poly, uh, Polycarp comes to my mind, you know. He was about eight years old when this, this mob said, Oh, here is, you know, here is the father of the Christians. He is the one who is defying our faith, their faith in their idolatrous gods and their, 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 their abominations. And then the Inquisitor, the one who investigated him, said, Well, you know, you're old enough. Why don't you just, you know, why don't you just uh, do something, say something that is not according to God and just let's finish this. And the Polycarp, the old Polycarp says, 50 years he has done me not wrong once, even once in my life. And I'm supposed now to betray him? No. Yeah. That was the end of his life. Sometimes do you, do you ask yourself, brethren, what would be the end of your lives? What if you don't die natural death? What if we don't account it, we we are not accounted worthy to escape? What if a persecution breaks out in your area? What if <laughs> do you think? Do you ever wonder what will be the end of your lives? Will you end will you end your life like Polycarp, faithful to the very end? Or would you just be finding some excuses, including reaching out to the things like the evil one, you know, 
swearing all the more is from the evil one you know swearing and trying to get out of sad situations brethren what would be the end of your life do you ever wonder yeah i think you should i think you should you know and I think it's a very important thing because God gave us this life and obviously gave, gave us this life for his honor and glory, but we can also very much dishonor him and uh, we can just tarnish his glory by, by, our, by our own actions. Do you wonder sometimes how will your life end? Now back to the third heaven. So the third heaven, God further draws back the curtain and reveals more about his throne in Revelation chapter 4, where in a few sweeping verses, the Apostle John tantalizes us with panoramic glimpses of the celestial pageantry and power of the heavenly throne room. Of the specific layout and furnishing of the place, we know by but little, but however, in addition to the items listed in Revelation 4, we are told that the lampstand, table, showbread, and other artifacts of the earthly tabernacle were merely physical counterparts of heavenly things. Although an exact explanation of what this means is not given. But nevertheless, we are just told this much in Hebrews chapter 9. And let's just read it. Hebrews chapter 9. We just said about these heavenly heavenly realities this much. Verse 1. Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which it was lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called holiest of all. And then it continues up to verse 5, that uh, Holius Holwich had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot and the head of the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the ta tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing and the mercy seat of these things we cannot now speak in detail <laughs> all right so that that was enough we, we don't have any details but we have that much and then in verse the same uh, chapter verse should be 23 where it says therefore all it was necessary that the copies of these things in heaven should be purified with these but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, of course, because verse 24, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. If he was the one to appear in the presence of God for us, that means that Enoch and Elijah could not have appeared before God for us. Brethren, brethren. But sometimes we just totally, we just take for granted all of these Protestant doctrines that just come to us and we just adopt it as if the, the, these are these are the dogmas. Because yes, because it looks, looks, looks logical, but it's not. On the surface it looks, looks logical. Yes, of course, you know, they were translated not to see death. They were just taken away. You know, Elijah was taken up in up to heaven in 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 in, 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 in the in the in the char in the chariot. And so and so and so people think Oh, it makes sense. Yeah, it's written there. Yes, it's written, but there are certain uh, subtleties in language. Or there are certain accounts that later Elijah, at some point later, after being taken up to heaven, he was writing to the next king. He was writing him a letter reminding him of what his father did and how his father was such and such. And look what you have done. So Elijah was still alive somewhere, you know. And Enoch, being of, of flesh and blood... Uh, 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 certainly not. Could well, you know, could have he. He certainly could not have attained immort immortality without flesh and blood after being dead, because you know, because then he will be our savior. It is Jesus Christ who had to be, who had to come back from from the dead, 
And it was Jesus Christ who had to go before Father for us. Not Enoch, not Elijah, not Moses, not nobody, brethren, nobody. And yet so many Sabbath keepers never read the words, or they have read, but they didn't connect it with reality, the words of the very Savior Jesus Christ to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. No one has come up to heaven except for the one who came down from heaven, and that, that one was only him. But you see, Sabbath keepers generally, and now you understand why I say we are so igno we are so I I I ignoramuses, we are just ignorant of various things. Sabbath keepers don't make those connections, you see. Many Sabbath keepers around the world. And they have adopted this, 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 this blasphemous and anti-biblical doctrine that Enoch has attained already immortality before all of us. No, 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 no way. Or they just adopt other doctrines that just, you know, how much they don't know about the house of Israel, don't even, don't even ask me. You know, I had people in India, oh, but we are Gentiles, you know. Well, I said, yes, you might be born in a Gentile country, you might have been born in, among the Gentiles, you might have practiced Gentile practices before God called you, but, you know, don't you think, don't you think that the scattering of the house of Israel might have affected your nationality as well? Don't you think that there are many people in India now practicing all these all these kinds of religions, but there are many actually Israelitish in origin? And why should that be strange, brethren? Why should that baffle anyone? If God said in Amos that he will scatter the house of Israel into every nation, why should we be battled and why should we not believe that? If he said every nation, that means every nation. That means that not only are the Israelites in Israelitish countries, but there are many lost Israelites everywhere in Gentile countries. The dear God knows how many. And why should be then anybody surprised if, if I hear from some of the people who are into the subject, the estimation that there are 2 billion descendants of the House of Israel in Asia. Why should I be all of a sudden surprised if we know that the promise to Abraham, promise to Isaac, promise to Jacob was, your descendants will be as numerous as stars in heaven. Try to count me the stars in heaven, if you could, brethren. Why should we? Why? Why do we? Ex why do we allow ourselves to be all of a sudden shocked? No, no, not even shocked. We're even worse. Rejecting, we should be rejecting such claims. Oh no, we should be. Well, why should we reject it if we know the truth, brethren? And if we connect the dots of the truth, why should we be surprised? What if, what if there's, what if there is two billion more descendants of the House of Israel in Africa? What about that? You're supposed to be surprised. Why should you be? I told you, I've seen traces of lost Israel all over Kenya. I quoted to you the uh, things from the Ethiopian history. Why should you be surprised? Let me now throw at you something else. How many millions of people in Europe are descendants of, of, of the House of Israel? Oh, you will say, yes, certainly, Northwest Europe and British Isles and Scandinavia. Really? Well, did you know that in the Balkan Peninsula, occupied by South Slavic people, the Celts were the early and the earliest settlers? Did you know that? Of course you didn't. Celts. And all of you, or at least those who are educated enough, know that the Celts are lost Israelites. They lived in the Balkan Peninsula, brethren. They lived in Middle Europe. Their borders extended all the way up from the Balkans, all the way up in Europe, all the way to the Gaul, to the Gauls. The Gauls are the, 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 the part of land that French occupy today. But then why should we be so shocked all of a sudden? Why should we think it's all uh, not interesting? When, because you tell me, how could such a huge, huge, huge number of Israelites, how could it fill the earth? How could it be fulfilled? How? If they all stayed in a small, small little promised land, and then, then, then just how? How? How could all that be, com you know, completed? And again, 
knowing the Bible history, knowing knowing the facts in the Bible, why should we be surprised? You know, if you stop and then connect the Bible history, and then all of a sudden because it becomes clear to you. Yeah, of course. There are at least, at least two billion descendants of the House of Israel in Asia. There might be at least two more billions in Africa. There might be at least who knows how many more millions in, in, in Europe. What about South America? You know, let, let me give you again a hint. The Mayas and Incas of South America, people were just making those ziggurats, as they call it. They looked like the pyramids, Ethiopian pyramids. So one of the one of the uh, theories say that those pyramids, of course, it was uh, something that the Israelites learned how to build the pyramids while they were in Egypt, and we know that we, they were involved in building the pyramids. And then probably their descendants, who just later scattered all over the world, some of their descendants knew how to make those ziggurat-like buildings. But then why should we be surprised? But we are surprised, you know why, brethren? Because we have so underestimated the role of Israel that God has given to Israel. We have so much underestimated all the teachings about Israel that we just get shocked. And, you know, let, let irony be even greater. Those in India who resisted this idea, we, 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 we're in the Gentile nation, they live in a part of India where the Christianity, nominal Christianity, is a majority. Interesting, isn't it? And why should any of you listening to this be resistant to the truth and say well, well no not me why should i be an israelite well why should you not be an israelite by origin i mean why should you not be yes you're pagan by your religious affiliation you're pagan by not understanding just like much of the house of israel today they're just pagans they're just plainly pagans because they do not practice the way of God, the way of the Lord. They, 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 they're pagans and that's it. But, you know, considering their their uh, origin, no matter how pagan they are, they're still, by origin, they're Israelites. And once they accept Jesus Christ, and once they repent, of course, then they will become Israelites. Yes, once they turn to the God of Israel, they'll become Israelites. But in the meantime, there are many of you who are not being born in those... Israelitish countries who have already turned to the God of Israel. Well, what else can you be then? You turn to the God of Israel, you follow the God of Israel, you just practice the God. What else can you be? What else can you be but Israelites? So anyway, we have three thrones. They're revealed in the Bible. So going to heaven, three thrones, I said, sorry, I meant three heavens. <laughs> we have three heavens, so uh, to which heaven are the saved? Are, uh, which heaven is the reward of the saved, you know? None. Absolutely none. But we need not guess about whether heaven is the reward of the saved because we are directly told in no uncertain or ambiguous terms in the Bible. And the answer will shock many. The answer will shock many. Here it is. Be shocked. Jesus, well, I already mentioned John 3.13. Jesus plainly taught and he said to Nicodemus, no one has ascended to heaven. No one, if it is no one, then it is no one. Then it is no Enoch. Then it is no, no, no Elijah. It is no Moses. No one. No. Brethren, no one is no one. Please take the word of God, the authority of God, literally. So no one has ascended to heaven, but he who, ha who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man. The Son of Man. So it's only Jesus Christ himself and nobody else. And astoundingly, that scripture means just what it says. No man, not Abraham, 
no Isaac, no Jacob, no one, brethren, no one, no Elijah, no Enoch, no one has gone to heaven. There is no soul of the saved in the heaven. It cannot, therefore, be the reward of the saved. As simply as that. Now, people do not like to believe this plain statement of Jesus Christ. Yet, even King David said, said to be a man after God's own heart, as you remember in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, and one who found favor with God, it's in Acts 7, verse 46. Even David was not in heaven, even after Jesus' death. As the Apostle Paul said, because the Apostle Paul during the first, I mentioned already the first day of Pentecost uh, during the New Testament, uh, that will be in Acts chapter 2, verse 9. Peter said, Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. And then Peter added, For David did not ascend into the heavens. That's in verse 34. No one ascended into heavens, brethren. No one. Uh, and remember, notice that, uh, uh, that Peter said into heavens because he knew there were three heavens. Unlike most of us who today wouldn't have known that unless we had it revealed clearly in the Bible. So, we have now seen that heaven is God's throne and we have read that it most assuredly is not the abode of the deceased souls of the righteous. But uh, then what is the future hope and goal of true Christian? Excellent question. And here is the answer. Well, put briefly, the hope... <laughs> the hope of Israel, yes, indeed. That's the hope of all Christians, indeed, and all nations, in fact. So, but the hope and goal of Christian, of a Christian, is not to enter heaven and play a harp, play a harp for eternity, you know, or clap your hands and praise their God, you know, day and night. No, 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 no. The hope and goal of a Christian is to be born into the family of God as a member of God, of the God family, and hence become a literal God, and rule in God's government and kingdom with eternal life from the, from the earth. And now that the Christians will rule from the earth, you have in, in Revelation 5.10, and even in Matthew 5.5, 5, so let's, let's go to Matthew 5.5. 5. Revelation 5.10, we have quoted already enough, I think, but look at Matthew 5, 5, brethren. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit what? They shall inherit the heaven? No, they shall inherit, inherit the earth. Revelation 5, 10 says, I know it by heart already. He made us kings and priests, and we shall rule on the earth. And somebody would say, well, okay, New Testament. Well, uh, well even the Old Testament in the book of Daniel speaks about this. This is the book of Daniel, and uh, it should be chapter 2. And verse 4 will be 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven, we quoted that last Sabbath, will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Indeed, and also in the same book of Daniel chapter 7, uh, we, we read the same truth in verse 27. This is chapter 7, verse 27, which says, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven of the kingdom of the hell heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. So even the plain scriptures cited now, showing that heaven is not the abode of the righteous, dead, nor the promised reward of the saved, are scarcely, brethren, even scarcely even sufficient answer to the objections of those who believe that Jesus promised heaven to the good to the good who die so tragic 
Rather, those people who just deny that they cannot accept that, they just will. I, I'm really encouraging you not to be like that. They point to numerous scriptures that, in their minds at least, seem to say we do go to heaven at death. For example, some will point John 14, verses 1 through 4, which quotes Jesus telling the disciples that in his father's house are many mansions and that he was going to prepare those mansions for them and say this passage. People would say this passage proves we go to heaven. But brethren, these verses say no such thing at all. Did it say all the saints you'll go to heaven? No, it doesn't say. For the father's house is not heaven, but the temple of God. John 2.16 will tell you that. And that temple of God had many, which had many chambers or mansions, each for the use of a specific job or function. So it's actually the many mansions as many functions in the kingdom of God. The disciples correctly understood Jesus to be saying that in his kingdom were many responsible positions and that he was going to prepare a job for them and that he would bring it with him when he comes again. When he comes again, why does he come again? Why is he coming again? He's coming again to set up his kingdom on earth. Well, let's check John chapter 14. That's where the mentions are mentioned. John, John chapter 14. And let's see verse 3, which he, when he tells them that there are many, many offices in his father's house. And uh, John 3 and, uh, sorry, John 14 it should be. And verse 3, John 14. Here it is in verse 3. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may also be. That's what he meant. And you also have Revelation, the last chapter in Revelation. That will be chapter 22. Revelation 22, and then you have in verse 12, And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. And that's exactly how disciples did understand Jesus Christ's word. Then there are other people who turn to the Philippians, chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, and they quote Paul's statement that he desired to depart and be with Christ, and they take it as a proof text for going to heaven after death. Brendan, but Paul does not in this verse, in this in those verses, does not say where he will meet Jesus Christ, nor when. Paul does in other verses clearly show that the end that he and the rest of the righteous will meet Jesus at the time of the resurrection and on earth in its clouds at his second coming. He is writing about that in First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17, not in heaven. He says that the saints will be taken up to the air to meet Christ in the air, not in heaven. And then from that point on, they will be always. But we don't know what he meant. What well, we do from Zechariah chapter 14, because it says that once the saints are taken to the air, from the air, Jesus Christ is coming to a, a rushing. He is coming back to the earth, crushing all the opposition and rushing, and that his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. And that all the saints, all those who are righteous, really, who are resurrected, those are the many. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. Those are many brethren after him. That he will come, Jesus Christ, with all them, and that he will indeed uh, make the kings and priests over the earth, that he will indeed become the King of kings and Lord of lords over the whole earth. And consider also this. If the saved souls of millions are now in heaven, why must there be a resurrection of the dead in the first place? Why do we have the whole resurrection chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 15? Obviously because the dead are just dead. They are dead and in their graves, not in heaven. So they have to resurrect. If they are still alive, then what's the purpose of resurrection? They still have to resurrect. Nevertheless, obviously, they have to resurrect so that they will be given their chance, their first and only chance for salvation. Also, likewise, they often quote the scripture saying, Great is your reward in heaven, in Matthew 5, verse 12, is misunderstood by many. Often verse 5 that uh, of that chapter is not read. 
where Jesus says the righteous will inherit the earth. So usually, you know, these who, those who deceive you will quote the heaven and they will not quote about the righteous who are going to come to the earth. And they will not quote that the righteous will inherit the earth. Nor is this second section compared with First Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, which says a Christian's reward is reserved in heaven. And Revelation 22, verse 12, which shows that although the reward is reserved in heaven, Jesus will bring it with him and give it to us when he returns to earth. That's what it is, brethren. But, uh, of course, there will be, I would need much time to now tell you uh, in detail other misunderstood passages of scriptures, such as those concerning the true fate of Enoch and Elijah. You have a special teaching about, about Enoch and Elijah, because they many, many falsely suppose they went to heaven based upon misunderstood verses, or the theory of the thief on the cross, Lazarus, and the rich man, and Paul's vision of heaven in chapter chapter 2, uh, sorry, in Second Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. It would just take me too much time, and I think I've explained it in other messages, so I do not need to, do not need to spend more time on that. What I do need to tell you, brethren, is to give you some key verses, because aside from knowledge of the often misunderstood verses just mentioned, the whole subject of heaven can be grasped by remembering relatively few, few scriptures, if you care to remember them. Great. If you just want to jot them down and have them, yes, it's it's equally great. Also, there are these main, main scriptures on, on that. Matthew 5.34, which says heaven is God's throne. Revelation 4, which describes that throne. John 3.13, which states that no man has ascended to heaven. And John 2, verse 29 through, 20, uh, through 35, states that even after Jesus Christ's ascension, David the righteous had not gone to heaven. Also, brethren, it is helpful to remember a few verses showing that God's kingdom will be on earth. That's Matthew 5, 5 that I read. That's Daniel 2, uh, verse 44. And even, uh, sorry, not not uh, verse 2, but Daniel chapter 4, chapter 2, verse 44. Daniel chapter 7, verse 27. And Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. So, brethren, in conclusion, yes, the biblical truth about heaven is easily summarized. Heaven is God's throne and current seat of government, but it is not the promise, promised reward of the saved. So how wonderful is our God to reveal through his true church the blessed truth about this important subject in this end age. And uh, now I hope that we have, we have finally uh, analyzed and understood that. Now I hope that we can continue living with this wonderful precious knowledge and that we can continue to be working on our salvation with fear and trembling, as it says in, in Philippians, and that we can continue to live with the awareness that we are indeed, that we are indeed being in the process of reserving our place in the kingdom of God.